going to stop sharing for just a second and I started recording. I'm going to welcome everybody to our peer-to-peer uh, -peer about our third session talking about uh, virtual tours. Uh, generally, we're covering K-12 audiences today, and we know that's a topic that's been um, really important to everybody because it generally is our bread and butter in the museum ed world. Um, so thank you for joining us on our day off. Uh, I hope folks are taking a moment for some rest and relaxation and definitely reflection and thinking about how uh, we can all contribute to uh, a more just and uh, equal and anti-racist and anti-oppressive society. Um, I'm Julian Chevalier. I am the director of the Museum Education Division of NAEA. I use she, her pronouns as a visual description. I'm a white woman with um, short, fake red hair, <laughs> um, a roundish face, and today a magenta sweater and a circle necklace. I am sitting on my couch in front of a uh, yellowish wall and a multicolored uh, art print on the wall behind me. Um, really glad to have everybody here. The, the link in the, the uh, chat is about pre-con. Um, Hopefully this is a year that if you haven't been able to come to pre-con in the past, you can come this year because it is virtual. It is going to cost $49 for members or non-members of NAEA, and it is going to be held over two non-consecutive days, February 23rd and February 25th. Um, 11 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are very excited that we have Trisha Hersey, who is founder of the NAP Ministry, will be presenting our keynote on um, rest and self-care as acts of liberation. Um, I'm paraphrasing the title of her, her talk, but that is the gist of it. Um, and then we'll have a uh, lot of opportunity to gather in small groups for reflection, some time for some virtual gallery teaching to share, um, some deeper dive opportunities, um, and some other fun stuff. So do hope that you can join us. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I am missing right now. I do not think so. I'm also going to put up in the chat a link to a blog post that I wrote recently for Art Museum Teaching, which summarizes the results of a survey that NAEA did in collaboration with um, RKNA this summer to examine the effects of COVID-19 um, and the ensuing economic recession on the museum education field. Um, we've been hit pretty hard. So I'll link to that article and you can, can see some of those uh, results as well. Um, all right, I think uh, we're ready to go. Really excited to have Mike Deach helping out today by uh, serving as our moderator. And I'll send things over to Mike so that he can introduce our panelists today. Thanks so much for being here, everybody. Thanks, Julian. Um, my name is Mike Deach. I am the Director of Education and Engagement at the Toledo Museum of Art in Northwest Ohio. Uh, we are actually open today. Uh, we're not normally open on Mondays, but we made the last minute decision to open up for MLK and waived any uh, entry or parking fees and had 100 people come in the first 30 minutes. So uh, yeah, it's been a great response. At any rate, uh, excited about uh, today's program. Um, we have uh, guests from the Cleveland Museum of Art as well as the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, as Julian mentioned, they're gonna be talking uh, about um, our uh, virtual field trips, uh, which I'm sure everybody on this call is well accustomed to at this point, uh, but we're gonna get some insight as to some of the trials and opportunities uh, that this group uh, has been running into over the last uh, 10 months or so. So the way this is gonna work is I'm just gonna ask them a number of questions for the start of the session, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to open it up uh, to everybody. So um, before I jump into the questions, maybe if I could get uh, our panelists to introduce themselves. Since Heinel is the sole Cleveland representative, I will start with her first. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, so my name is Heinel Epley, and 
I am the Western Division rep for NAEA, um, and the Western Division does include Ohio. So um, I am in Northeast Ohio. We're kind of hugging from the other side, on the other end, Toledo and Ohio, or Toledo and Cleveland, excuse me. Um, I am the department director of gallery teaching at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and we have not really been in the galleries for the last 10 months. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that um, a little bit later today. And I'm gonna pass it over to Celeste, who's also um, on the development committee with me and let her introduce herself. Thanks, Heinel. Hi, everyone. My name is Celeste Feta. I'm the Director of Education at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, Virginia. Um, we have been open since July um, and remain open. Um, and uh, I have two colleagues with me from the VMFA ed team, and I'm really going to defer <laughs> to them. Um, you know, they're, I, I like to say, on the virtual ground um, and doing this work. Um, so they're going to speak to their experiences and kind of how we've adjusted our distance learning program um, in response to what's happening in the world right now. So I'm going to, oh, and I am the Southeastern um, Division Rep um, for the Museum Ed Development Team. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and Maggie. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Rasich, and I am VMFA's distance learning content specialist. Um, and so work to kind of design the program as a whole and have my hand in some of the building out what we can offer for resources in our online um, component of the program. And I work very closely with my fabulous colleague, Maggie McGurn. Hello everyone, my name is Maggie McGurn. I am the distance learning educator at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and so I'm the face that students are seeing when they're meeting with us virtually. And I'm very excited to be here. Mike, back to you. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, and it just dawned on me too that Celeste being the <clears throat> Southeast representative and Heinel being the West, and there's actually only one state West Virginia that separates Ohio from Virginia. So it's amazing that we can cover that geography in such a, <laughs> a short bit. Okay, so enough uh, about our uh, Atlas lessons today. Uh, so this is gonna be a question for um, both museums here. Um, obviously we are uh, in month 10 now of uh, the pandemic. Uh, for coronavirus and a lot of things have changed around our institutions, particularly the way we operate field trips. So I was hoping that for the larger group, you all could just share a little bit about what your program was like prior to the March shutdown and uh, whether that was, uh, you know, virtual tours or not, and then how that program has evolved uh, since that time. So whoever wants to take it first. Do you all want to go first this time? <laughs> you can go ahead. OK. Um, so uh, in terms of the CMA, the Cleveland Museum of Arts um, virtual programming, we've definitely had a lot of changes since March. Uh, and one of the things that we, we were thankful for or lucky to have is that we have been doing um, distance learning or virtual learning with students for about 20 years. Uh, and so we, we had an already established audience with that and in some ways a framework that we could step into with that, although it has definitely changed over time. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna be getting into that. Our, our virtual audience before COVID was almost entirely made up of schools and teachers that were outside of our geographic region. So, it was a lot of people outside of our state, even out of our country. We served a lot of people in Canada. Um, we've served some in other countries as well. And that program also ran from a broadcast studio in the basement of our museum with largely one staff member who taught and one staff member who moderated. Um, one of the biggest shifts that has happened over the past 10 months or so is that 
uh, all of our gallery teaching staff, which was a larger team of people, have um, migrated to doing virtual learning. And although um, our building has been open on and off, our education staff for the most part have been working remotely since March. So none of us are in the building. None of us are broadcasting from the studio or from the galleries. We are uh, connecting with students via Zoom or Google Meet uh, through computers from our homes. And so for the most part, we are using um, a presentation that has images and then focusing on techniques that allow us to connect with students and engage with students um, in interactive ways. And uh, that can be through drawing, through writing, through movement, through, through discussion and dialogue. But that's, that's kind of been a really big shift for us is that taking a lot of the hands-on strategies that we were using in the galleries and then moving them or translating them into an environment where we cannot touch, we cannot touch objects and we cannot touch anything. We can invite students to interact with their environment while we are connecting with them from a distance. So that's the long and the short of it. Um, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Sarah and Maggie to tell you a little bit more about VMFA. Yeah. So. Um... VMFA, like Cleveland, actually already had an established program in terms of distance learning. Ours is much, much, much younger. Um, we're in about our fourth year, third really, of, of really being fully launched. Um, and in a nutshell, the way that distance learning program worked before COVID was um, we streamed from the galleries rather than from a studio. We had a remote cart with a um, high definition of camera on it. And Maggie was in the gallery with the artworks, talking to the students over Zoom, over our own Zoom meeting, um, right into the classroom. Um, that was separate from our tour services and our sort of in-gallery on-campus tours, which was um, run through another ed department um, group. And after COVID, uh, the way that changed was when we first closed in March, from March to July, um, we did do a few sessions with teachers, again, in that sort of presentation format, um, meeting students over Zoom or Google Meet, depending on what the classroom was doing. And once we reopened in July, we continued streaming from the galleries. However, I was in the gallery with the cart wearing a mask, Maggie was working from home, um, where it was easier to, to interact with a number of connections rather than a single connection. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but in a nutshell, that's kind of where we were and where we are um, for the distance learning program. The tours that we are running on site our docents are not operating, our tour guides are not operating in the museum. That staff is working on some asynchronous materials that can, can take the place of, in terms of content, the kinds of things those tours covered. Um, not quite an experience, but just trying to bridge that gap a little bit is what they're up to. Maggie, did you have anything you wanted to add about changes? Um, I just wanted to mention um kind of the the structure and the bones of our sessions which mm -hmm. um have really remained largely the same pre-covid and post-covid we with our distance learning sessions they're normally lasting you know 50 to 60 minutes um pre-covid we were looking at two pieces in a session so they were really a deep dive into these objects um very sorry i thought i had to sneeze for a second um very inquiry based very experiential learning um and kind of guiding students through an activity to get those thoughts and conversations and discussions going so also very student-led and that was something that we felt very strongly needed to stay the same post covid um so a number of the changes that we made were to allow that to remain the same um so as opposed to having students and teachers come into our our personal Zoom meeting, we have been meeting with teachers in their virtual classrooms, whether it be Google Meet or Zoom. Um, 
just because it's a logistically easier for teachers. It's easier for us to remain under privacy policies that way. And it's allowing students to stay within a virtual classroom and virtual setting with virtual protocols that they're comfortable with. Um, but conversations with, with teachers have gotten lengthier and more time consuming and that we're adding planning meetings with test calls so that we can share all those logistical changes with them and documenting those meetings so that Sarah and I can both you know, have access to those notes when we're not sharing an office. So that has kind of added to, to prep for sessions. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to add. So I'm interested because, <clears throat> you know, both of you all museum wise um, indicated, right, you, you have already established distance learning programs. And so there was already an audience sort of set in and, and Sarah, you sort of touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious about, and I presume, so correct me if I'm wrong, that those that are coming on field trips, those schools are, that are coming on field trips wouldn't necessarily be the same audience that would participate in the distance learning program. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm just curious as to those schools that would have normally come on a field trip, have you been able to port them over into this new model? Or are you really only working with that sort of group that had already been established through your distance learning programs? Um, that's a great kind of, did you want to say something before I do? Go ahead, you can go. Okay. So that's a very good question and a good point. Um, so, so there's a there's a couple aspects at work here. One is that our program is so young that um, our audience was just getting established. Uh, the second, in terms of who was who we were interacting with, um, because we were dropping into classrooms kind of within a 50 minute period, we actually were um, capitalizing on that time frame to attract K-12 audiences who wouldn't, even local ones who weren't coming. And that was mostly middle school and high school because of their, the constraints of their um, class schedules. And we found um, that we were, we were actually gaining that audience across the board. So locally and across Virginia, because logistically it just made sense for teachers. They were like, oh, you can just come into my classroom. I don't have to rearrange my student's schedule. I don't have to. So um, we were already looking at that as a big plus in terms of um, offering the, the experience as a multiple visit possibility for some of those teachers. Um, so we kind of were across the, across the spectrum anyway, but I don't feel like we have a, a deep understanding of exactly who our audience is quite yet, pre, pre or post COVID. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, sh I should have said this before, uh, that while we were working primarily with people outside of our geographic region for virtual learning before COVID, right now, um, I would say that it's probably about half people in our region who would have visited in person and then half of that kind of older audience or I shouldn't say older our audience that had been already connecting with us virtually um, there's also a small sliver of people actually mostly from our geographic region who have never done anything with us before um, in person or virtual and that this experience of COVID, I think, kind of um, forced them into looking for um, resources outside of their classroom in a different way. And so we have had a smaller number of people who were working with for the very first time, but could potentially translate in the future into people that we work with in person or virtually. Uh, so I'll, it will be interesting to see kind of where that goes after we can resume in person. Um, opportunities with, with students. Thank you all. And, and you know, for, for those that are just on the call today, you know, we, we hosted the same session on Thursday. And one of the, one of the reasons that this question was prompted for me uh, is that we heard at least from previous museum representatives, right, that they're still struggling to engage with their local school district because of any number of reasons, like teachers don't have time, to add a virtual field trip into what they're doing. So it's really interesting to hear from Cleveland and Virginia that there is um, it, 
there's sort of a mix of brand new people, already existing customers, and then there's still the I don't have time right now. <laughs> you know, I'll figure out. Uh, I'll figure out when I can. So, um, you know, at Maggie, you sort of answered this a little bit already, and talking about the conversations with teachers and how that sort of changing right in this new format that you have. But I'm hoping that you all can talk about um, what role schools have been playing in the development of this sort of new way of doing things. I mean, I, I think, of course, right, there are logistical things, right? As an example, Heinel said, all of the staff are not coming into the museum. So like, there are real like practical reasons why you're making the decisions that you're making right now. But uh, could you all talk a little bit about what schools are doing, what conversations you're having with administrators or teachers as far as like, we can offer this and if you're getting feedback or input uh, as far as what they want. Yeah, why don't I let VMFA go first because I know Maggie kind of started that a little bit. So I'll let you all expand and then we can pop over to me. Maggie, do you want to talk about some of the requests we've been getting and kind of how that's the, the different types of things we've been facing? Sure. Um, yeah, I think I think there is definitely a, and we talked about this at our last peer-to-peer, -peer, um, that, that there is a shift in um, what teachers are looking for from our, our distance learning sessions and that it does seem a lot less kind of tied directly to um, like the standards of learning and things like that and more that they want an engaging experience for their students. And so there's a little less pressure of, of directly kind of correlating to something that, you know, they're learning in class where they want their students to kind of actively shout out what they've been learning and just have like a good time with us. Um, so that's been a little different just mindset wise. Um, and Sarah, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about kind of um, other aspects that teachers have affected. Yeah, so um, just a few things we've been, um, our department has been in touch with, we've got a teacher advisory council, we've been serving teachers who have interacted with both on site tours and with us and trying to get a feel for how, how things have been evolving since March to now. Um, and as I'm sure a lot of you have, have heard from teachers, um, there was just a, an immediate, um, I mean, we were very inspired by teachers, the way they just were pivoting, to use a word that is completely overused right now, but appropriate in this circumstance, <laughs> um, the way they were just um, shifting and trying to really think about the ways in which their students were able to interact first and foremost. And that sort of shaped the kinds of experiences we could um, provide and that they could provide. They were also looking in terms of online resources in general, not just, not just live interactions, but resources in general that could be more student facing, um, that they could plug into their and present to their students with their learning management systems effectively. Um, so that shifted the way in which we've been building those items out. Um, and then also um, just really shifting and embracing the, the availability they had to be online with their students. Some of them, I think initially and rightly so, were careful and jealous of the time that they could spend online face-to-face -face with their students. Um, but, but I will say that over the last couple of months, now that everybody's a little more comfortable, um, we have been getting, I would say, more enthusiastic um, requests for that online experience. And again, what Maggie said, just the need that students, that teachers are recognizing for students to just kind of take a break from content delivery and towards experiential learning as much as they're able to provide it. Um, and, and a lot of the things that Sarah and Maggie talked about translate into what we experienced as well. Um, when COVID first began, we sent out a survey to uh, the teachers that were on our email list, you know, probably about seven or 800 folks just to kind of check in. Because at that point, I think we were very much even just trying to understand what all of the situations were in, in all of the districts. So 
um, in Ohio, the, the districts are um, plenty. They are not county based. They are largely um, municipal districts. And so we have thousands of them <laughs> that, that we work with. Uh, and so this, the initial survey was really just like, what are you using at school? What are you allowed to use? What do you need from us? How long of a experience are you looking for? Do you prefer live or synchronous or asynchronous? So we sent out something like that in April of um, last year, kind of towards the beginning of COVID. And most of what we got back unsurprisingly was teachers saying, here's what I know, but mo here's mostly what I don't know. <laughs> And that, that um, I think was really helpful to us just in terms of even understanding, okay, we might have a little bit of information to help us start. The, the one, two big concrete things I would say we got out of that were that most people were using either Zoom or Google products in their districts, um, at least in our area. There were some other ones, but we elected to focus our energy. We were not going to be able to invest in all of the different things. so. Um, we took the top two, which were either Google Classroom or, or Zoom. And then the other big thing that teachers were talking to us about, which was uh, newer, was that need for support with social emotional learning. So that ended up becoming um, something that, that we had already, we were already thinking about it a little bit, but we developed a whole new series of topics. Um, focused on social emotional Hello. learning through art. And that was very much, excuse me, my watch is talking to me. Um, that was very much because of all of the stress that people were under in that moment. And we really wanted to take the opportunity to develop resources for how art could help with uh, three particular strands of social emotional learning, um, self-awareness, self-management, and social awareness. Uh, so that was something that, that came out of it that was new. Uh, we have been in regular contact with a couple of our educator groups. I think they, uh, VMFA mentioned that as well, or somebody mentioned that in the chat as well. Um, we have an education educator advisory group, and then we also have a group of teaching fellows who are a smaller group of teachers that work with us in a very deep way. And we're continuing to have regular conversations with them because as I'm sure is the case for all of you, things still keep changing. And uh, this year we found that really people weren't ready for us until they had kind of settled into the reality of what this school year was going to look like somewhat. And obviously that's still changing, but um, it, October, which was kind of the second quarter for us, was really when a lot of districts were more ready to have that discussion. The first quarter was a lot of us waiting and listening um, and saying to them, we're here when you need us. Here's what we can, or here's some of the questions or things that we wonder from you. Please share with us what your needs are and we're ready for you when you're ready for us kind of thing. So I've seen there are a few questions that have been popping into the chat. So thank you all. And um, some technology uh, related questions, which uh, I, I think have been answered. Um, and again, maybe this answer to the next question is already sort of set because of the relationships you already had. But one of the questions that came in is how are you getting the word out? about your new program, right? Like how are you marketing your new virtual programming? Even if it's changed, uh, I'm sure a lot of us are, are curious about that. Um, I think one of the things that's been an opportunity and also a challenge, and I don't know if the MFA feels this way, is that now all of a sudden teachers can connect with anyone anywhere. So it doesn't have to be us, even if they are in our community. And, and that's a great thing in a way that they have now opened up opportunities um, to work with somebody in San Diego, even if they're in Cleveland. But at the same time, it does mean, yeah, that getting your information out there when all these other places are getting information out there can be challenging. 
Um, we've found that while we can do, you know, emails and um, outreach in kind of a more marketing way, the word of mouth is still the most the most helpful. So um, some of it has been talking with people in districts that we've already worked with and having a conversation with them and then sometimes having them invite us to join a professional development session or a staff meeting or something like that where we can actually talk with the teachers. That has been actually the biggest. Um, early this year, when uh, I think it was right before the school year started, we did a really large professional development session for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. And even though that was already our audience, just having that meeting with them at that right time opened up a whole new um, avenue for a lot of people that maybe hadn't really thought about us or paid attention to us before just because we were actually talking with each other virtually. Um, we also have people that we worked with in the past who were kind of uncertain. This was mostly for the in-person, I would say, that they, they weren't really sure how it would translate into a virtual. And at first, I think, weren't really fully bought onto that. Um, but it really only took one or two people from their school trying it out and then most of the time saying, oh, that was that was great or that was fun. My students had a lot of fun. And then they kept kind of passing the word and they kept pouring in. So um, it's it's not to say that like emails and things don't work, but I think there's so many avenues for um, that type of content right now that it, it's it can be hard to sift through for teachers. Uh, so it, it takes more time to, to make phone calls and to try to talk to people, uh, but we've found that to be more helpful than, than some of the larger blanket marketing. Uh, BMFA, I don't know what if you guys <laughs> experienced that as well. I am vigorously nodding my head because of the parallels um, that I'm hearing. Um, so, we, I, yeah, I totally agree, you know, emailing and sending out announcements as much as we can through our Department of Education, um, through individual um, school systems is all great, but that can get lost in the shuffle. We have found that word of mouth is our greatest um, ally. And before COVID that happened quite a lot at just going to, to conferences. Um, that weren't necessarily art related, but we would go to the social studies conference. We would we would do, we had a math one that we went to or were ready to go to. Um, so just trying to find little inroads um, to sort of tell people that we we're there. But we also have a really wonderful ally in our teacher programs specialist at the BMFA who, um, has been fabulous in, in including us in the professional development opportunities that the teachers experience at BMFA. And of course, as that has moved online, as you said, um, I know that it has also opened up folks' eyes. Um, and also when we do that, just by kind of demoing what a session is like for teachers, there's a big light bulb that goes off. It's something that's really difficult to explain. <laughs> A, how it works, as you said, whether or not it's possible, and just also just the pedagogy, how that how that works. Um, so when they when they actually experience it, it seems to um, it seems to help. But marketing is is tricky. It is hard to get the word out. Um, but from our short lived experience, it seems like that the payoff for word of mouth and for sort of showing up and being present at other venues besides our own is very helpful. I'm glad to hear that it has been your experience too with your, your longer term program. Yeah, it's amazing to think, uh, you know, back in March and April and everybody was dying for virtual content. And now it's like the market's totally flooded with virtual content. So how do we like, distinguish ourselves, right? So people notice us. Uh, we're facing similar challenges here in Toledo, just getting people to be aware uh, of what we're offering. So 
you know, I think certainly uh, one theme that is resonating so far is change and adaptability and sort of, you know, working to see what's what's fitting, what's not, how are teachers responding, what do they need? So just talk to us uh, a little bit about, um, so, so what are you looking for, right? How are you defining whether or not these new programs are successful or not, right? I mean, things are obviously very different where you might be able to hand a teacher a survey directly in the galleries. We can't do that anymore. So, so what measures are you all taking to even do any kind of assessment? Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> oh, I was just I was just actually going to throw it to Maggie because um, she and I have talked a lot about <laughs> as we reflect after most sessions, you know, how do you feel that went and that how do you feel is is pretty huge at the moment. So I'd love for her to kind of address how she feels when a session appears to be successful or seems like it's going well. Yeah, and I, I know that, you know, as far as evaluation goes and like data points and quantifying your data, that's not, you know, long-term sustainable, but I think right now when we don't have, you know, pre-COVID when we were having all of them, you know, coming into our Zoom meeting in their classroom, we could record our sessions just for evaluation purposes. And that's not possible now just because of privacy issues. So it is very much like, how do we feel that session went? And, and how do we feel when we have a successful session? And how do we feel when we're like, that could have gone better? And I think a lot of it is, you know, how the students are reacting and responding to the session. And that is taking a whole lot of forms these days when they're all coming in virtually and there are sessions where you can see all of the students and there are sessions where they all have their videos off. There are sessions when they're responding to you verbally and there are sessions when they're just putting things in the chat. <clears throat> but with that kind of all those variables, there's a lot of things I think that we're seeing um, successes when there's like a steady stream of student responses, whether it's in the chat or just verbally, and they're just like keeping the conversation going and they're asking questions and they're, they want to see more pieces. I always love it when they're like, can we look at one more piece before we say goodbye? Or I really want to come to the museum. I've never been, or I've been to the museum, but it's been a long time and I want to come back. Um, so those little indicators when you just, you can tell that they're really invested in, in what you're, you know, the activity you're leading them through, the things that they're thinking about with that artwork. Um, and when we can see them, because we can see them pretty well when they're, you know, right in front of the screen, um, you can see the moments that they like light up or that they like want to share with you what they're doing if they're doing a drawing activity that they want to show you or they want to share, you know, how it's going as they're doing it. and you know, their, their faces when they see like the scale of a piece and things like that. Um, so I think just being really aware of student reactions and student responses, whether it's in the chat or verbally or just like via, you know, facial expressions and, and you know, body language. Yeah, um, and think th I'm glad that you said that, Maggie, because that's something that I sometimes forget to just in this format is that Pre, prior to COVID, we weren't usually seeing students connecting from individual devices. So I think Maggie and Sarah said this last time too, that you know our, our distance learning programs in the past were typically like one webcam for an entire classroom. And so you probably couldn't see most of the students or at least see or hear them very well. And so now when we have students connecting from individual devices, they have more opportunity to communicate virtually and we have more opportunities to kind of read read the room virtually and that's that's been really wonderful um you know even sometimes silly things like you can see what they've named themselves and they might have called themselves darth vader or you know whatever pokemon you kind of get a sense right away of like oh, okay here's like somebody who's uh playing around a little bit uh, it, it, and I think Maggie mentioned in our last session, having their names up on the screen so that we can call on them. We can say, Stephanie, Claire, Bonnie, Laura, Lisa, Ann, Sarah. Um, that is really nice. It's a nice way to be able to kind of continue um, interacting with them. Uh, we, we do still reach out to teachers with a survey um following their experience but the response is way way down and 
that's completely understandable because teachers have a lot on their on their hands right now and you know filling out a survey for us is not generally at the top of their to-do list it's completely understandable um, so we're relying a lot on the same kind of things that Sarah and Maggie mentioned the ways that we can kind of read student engagement and then also sometimes having uh, conversations or follow-up emails from teachers that we've worked with uh, is really helpful. I think we're getting that more now than we usually do because it's a new thing. And so a lot of teachers that we worked with before in another way wanna tell us about how it went. Um, whereas before we, we had to kind of extract that from them in a different way. But some of the things that they might say are like, uh, you know, I have a hard time getting Celeste to participate in my virtual classroom. It was really cool to hear her talking a lot in this lesson or to see her sharing her drawing. You know, those are kind of evidences of success for us. Um, we also have some, we have a rubric for each of our um, lessons that actually came a lot out of the NAEA research study rubric for the um, how you observe certain behaviors, how you observe creative behavior or um, uh, problem solving, that sort of thing. We have one of those for our internal staff. And so we have some phrases on there sometimes when like, if you hear a student say this, this is kind of an evidence of the fact that our, our goals are being met. So for example, if you hear a student, you know, making a respectful comparison saying like, Sarah, said she liked that painting, but I think it's really ugly and here's why. And the student didn't say Sarah's ugly and stupid. The, the student said, I thought this paint, or I, my, I had a different opinion about it. Little phrases like that, that I think help keep us on track or help remind us that we are, we are moving towards that goal uh, that we're trying to reach can be really helpful as well. So how, does measuring success or looking for engagement change, if if at all, with asynchronous programming? Sarah, you mentioned a little bit, right? You guys are just starting to venture into this idea of you know pre-recorded or or whatever it is. So, will will your metrics of success be different? Right? Obviously, like you're not going to be able to see students <laughs> through uh, asynchronous. So, what what are your thoughts around that? Um. So interestingly, I was just starting to type this in the chat to, to mention we have a similar rubric that we're starting to use to help measure how students are responding to works of art, whether um, whether any kind of guided looking, either synchronous or asynchronous, can assist in formative learning of a particular topic. Um, it's pretty specific, but that's the one thing we feel like we can we can track in both. It's not the one thing. It's it, it's something we can sort of try to track in both spheres. So we have a tool called a visit observation tool that we're sending out to teachers and asking them to kind of track student responses. Um, we ask them to do it during a session, but it's also helpful when they are kind of looking for this for similar things in asynchronous experiences. And actually just this morning, I was reading one from a teacher who made that bridge both those things for us and said, I saw this happening with the asynchronous in the session, it looked this way. Um, so that was great. That tells me like, maybe there's something to this thing. And it's just a three, it's just a graphic or organizer with three kind of main response areas. One is where are your students kind of activating prior knowledge? What kind of comments or observations are you hearing along that realm? Where are they becoming curious? Where are the aha moments? Um, and that can include their frustrations with something, you know, just kind of what's, what's piquing their interest, either positively or negatively or whatever. And then um, what connections are they making either personally or curricularly with the object? So super simple. and. I don't know if that simplicity has helped, but we we're getting more we're getting more um, response and more follow up with that. So that's just in the very nascent stages. So I'm hoping it'll continue. 
And I just want to tag quickly onto that. I think with COVID and because we have developed a lot of asynchronous materials since March, um, and I mentioned pre-COVID, we were doing two kind of two pieces per session. Um, and with everybody coming on virtually and that just taking a little longer, we've only been doing one piece. So we've been doing a lot more pairing of asynchronous with synchronous sessions than we did pre-COVID. And a lot of teachers are using them pre-session. So we're able to talk to them about their experience with that asynchronous um, pre-activity kind of at the beginning of a session. So we're getting a little bit of a sense of the things that they were thinking about um, and, and observing in that, in that piece. I don't know how that will change, you know, post COVID, but as of right now, we have that, that nice little access when they do it um, pre-synchronous session. I think it's- um, and, and as for, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Go ahead, Heino. Uh, so as for us, I would say the ace or the asynchronous resources that um, we offered before COVID were really in the form of teacher packets. There were PDFs and they were largely um, meant to be printed or kind of used in hard copy. Um, we were already kind of planning to update those. And so COVID has kind of helped fast track that process for us and to migrate and look at different ways that we could um, offer people opportunities digitally. And so ours are not live yet, but they should be live very soon. Um, we hopefully next week will be coming, uh, will be becoming a content partner with Microsoft Flipgrid, um, which is a free platform for teachers to um, basically take prompts that are usually gen generated from an image or video, and then they can kind of drag that prompt into their own classroom website um, and ask their students to respond to the prompt using short videos. And we're also doing that with Seesaw, which is, um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it, but Seesaw in our region at least is used much more with the early childhood end of the spectrum. So in our urban school district, our, our large urban school district, Cleveland Metropolitan Schools, Seesaw is one of the big tools that they use. Um, and they have communicated to us, they actually can't connect in synchronous ways for the most part. So we have been working on developing both of those. And in terms of the metrics of how we measure success, um, the good news is that we can get a lot of that quantitative stuff within those platforms. Um, so on Flipgrid, for example, we can see how many times a teacher has added it to their own classroom. And we can also see the metric for hours of learning. So how long have students spent responding to it, uh, watching videos of other students in their class and responding to that. So it could say like this topic, you know, globally has had 27 hours of learning, or this one might have 67 hours of learning. So we can kind of see just how long people are using it and how many times people have used it. Um, we will not be able to see anything that the students have created. So like Maggie said, you know, there's a lot of that privacy stuff. We won't be able to hear what they've said or read what they've said. And so that part, we're hoping to be able to follow up with a survey to some of our teachers through just through email to say, have you used this? And if so, you know, what'd you like about it? What would you like to see that's different? Um, we had some conversations with a couple of other museums that have been content partners and they've said, you know, they have to kind of do that follow up separately because they really can only get the numbers from the platform. For some folks though, the numbers are key and can be very helpful that we don't actually have to count and track that. It just shows up as something that we can easily access and create reports around. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Mike. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a, it's a good reminder too that some of these softwares and our websites already have analytic reports built into them. It's just a matter of like, who in your museum can help you dig that stuff up, right? Um, and hopefully some of those numbers are there, although, right, as an example, our website can't actually track if people click a PDF, but they can track how many people landed on the page where the PDF is. So it's like, you know, 
a little bit of uh, sort of a guessing game. All right, so we're getting close to time, but I, I do want to ask, since uh, the term post-COVID was thrown out at least three times, um, and so there will be a post-COVID, presumably, right? I don't know when that is, maybe as soon as uh, the summer or fall, um, maybe 2022, but it, at some point it will be here. So just just briefly in the, in the short amount of time uh, that we have, how are you all thinking about the longevity of these programs or if there is longevity, right? Because presumably people will start visiting our museums with regular frequency again, they're gonna wanna do on-site trips and tours. Um, so, you know, how, what are you thinking about right now? Sustainability, longevity, uh, and, and where these things can go. Um, I can jump in and say that in our situation, the way that the staffing has worked out is that the people who are who were delivering our in-person gallery experiences for pre-K through 12 are also the people who are delivering the virtual experiences pre-K through 12. And so we will not be able to continue both of those at the same level with the amount of staffing that we have currently. Um, that said, uh, I think we're really hoping to be able to better connect teachers and students to using virtual and in-person and pers or possibly asynchronous resources kind of tied together in the future after COVID. So the options are out there now and they can hopefully more easily be tied together to say to someone, you know, you could do this asynchronous thing, then we could have an in-person visit, then we could have a virtual follow-up. Um, there's definitely more opportunities for that. We are gonna have to look at some creative scheduling and consider you know, the times that we have the highest demand for gallery experiences. Um, I think those are gonna take priority because we do generally feel that we have a greater impact when we are in person in the galleries with students. Um, but we also hope to maintain virtual experiences on some of our, I guess, less busy in-person times. Um, and that's going to be an interesting exercise, um, particularly for me, <laughs> as I'm managing everyone's schedules to figure out how we, we piece all those puzzle pieces together. So I don't have all the answers, unfortunately. But if anybody's figured out pressing the magic button, I'd love to hear all about it. <laughs> Oh, no magic buttons, sadly. <laughs> um, but um, I'll say for the VMFA, we are super, super fortunate in that, you know, Maggie and I are already a team designated for distance learning. And so we'll be able to continue the work we have been doing. Um, we'll be able to build on the experiences we've had in developing um, asynchronous materials. And then the ways in which we use those um, across the board will be interesting to see if, if um, they'll, if teachers will use them more as, as pre-visit resources, both for distance learning and for on-site visits as well. Um, what's the best way to make that happen? You know, <laughs> um, what's the best, there's just, it, it feels like at this moment, we've, we've done so much, we've built so much, and now it's a matter of what's what's the most efficient best way to capitalize on all that work that moves us forward and i feel like we're still swimming around in that a little bit um a lot of ideas floating around but just what that's going to look like exactly is a little nebulous at this point um and i don't know celeste you you probably can speak better to in terms of staffing or impacts that COVID has had or will have yeah, sure. Um, so our on-site guided tours are provided by volunteer tour guides. Um, and they have not been doing that, obviously, uh, because we're not hosting groups right now. And because they are volunteers, you know, we're really looking to them on where their comfort level is for, for doing so. Um, we're not sure when they're going to return uh, or we will return to, to guided group tours. A lot of that, again, depends on obviously COVID, but also uh, governor's restrictions on group gatherings, et cetera. Um, I 
yeah, so I'm not sure when, when we'll come back to that and how that will look and where that demand will be. Um, I think, and this was said kind of at the last session too, is how to, and, and Sarah just alluded to this too, like how do we merge the two or kind of build off of that virtual and asynchronous experience with our tour guides. And I think, you know, not only the, the how to, but also the uh, methodology and the structure of those visits is something we're really trying to work on too with our tour guides and, and kind of having a student centered, student centered approach um, to onsite touring as well. Um, and anyone who works with tour guides, you know what I'm talking about. So um, we're, we're um, trying to trying to kind of merge those two together anyway. And I think this is now even more of a push to do so. So hopefully I think having these positive experiences and this demand will kind of fuel that even further. Um, as we come back to, to on-site touring. I think the other challenge will be maybe even just from a year from now, like as people are more aware of, of distance learning, I think the demand will eventually start increasing more and how will we answer that demand? You know, Sarah and Maggie are only two people um, and we only have one cart. So I think long-term, and this is something we talked about even before COVID, you know, how will we, look to increase that uh, capability um, to, to offer more. Um, and that's something, again, as a state institution, you know, we're charged with serving the entire state as part of our mission. Um, and so, you know, some of our funding does come from, from the state. And I think there's also this sort of, and, and should be, you know, expectation like to serve as many people as we can. Um, and so I think, that long-term goal will, will be to, to expand kind of staffing, you know, if possible uh, to do that. And I think this is only an impetus to kind of push, push that, that goal. And I, I think certainly to both points that you all have illustrated um, our perspectives is once directors also see opportunities to continue to engage people virtually as well as on site, they're not gonna scale that back. Now, whether or not they resource it appropriately, that's a different question altogether. But I think if somebody can now see, oh, people from California and from New York and from wherever are now attending these programs, we don't wanna pull that away from them. So I think there will be this sort of push and pull that we're gonna have with our directors to make sure that we can actually keep up if we're only a group of two, as an example, right? So, all right. Uh, well, we are at one o'clock and I'm going to kick it back to Julian. But before doing so, uh, please, uh, everybody join me in thanking Heinel, Sarah, Maggie, and Celeste for their uh, insight today. Uh, really great. Um, uh, really great perspective and just to hear. So thanks uh, also to all of you for joining and for your great questions and your attentiveness. So with that, uh, Julene. Yeah, thanks so much, Mike. So thank you so much to Mike and also to uh, some of our other peer-to-peer -peer, uh, folks who uh, help plan these, including Kylie Crook and Gwen Fernandez, uh, who were not on the call today, but they're part of the development committee that, that make these happen. So thanks everybody. I look forward to uh, seeing you at future ones of these. I'll post a link to the uh, Museum Ed Division webpage, uh, which has all sorts of details about everything and you can find out more. Thanks so much, everyone. Hope everyone has a great day. See ya. <laughs>